Now his backs, John Bond is the man who gained better than 200 yards against Lou Holtz at Notre Dame. Bond and Bunch. Bunch goes in motion. That's what they'll do with Bond on first down. Break cut back to daylight. 40, 45, 50. Inside the 40-yard line with Carlton Gray catching him from behind. I get an email um, in March of this year from one of my best friends and ex-teammates at Michigan uh, who uh, pointed me to a February article that came out in Detroit News about allegations against uh, Dr. Anderson, who was the uh, team doctor um, while I was at Michigan. My initial thoughts were confusion, uh, disbelief, um, curiosity uh, to really find out the truth. Um, and I can remember the night that I woke up um, with the realization that I too was a victim. Um, I had a dream. The dream consisted of memories that centered around the exams and the interactions that I had with Dr. Anderson. You know, outside of the typical uh, physicals to be able to play, there were, I could smell the room. I could feel his breath um, because he used to get really close up on you uh, when he was inspecting your testicles and digitally penetrating my, my anus. Uh, I remember the first time it was, are you circumcised? Was I having sex? Or had I been sexually active? Was I using protection? Let me look at your penis for any, you know, abnormalities. And then those were always preceded with uh, one or two fingers being uh, inserted into my rectum. There's no reason why I should have had a prostate exam at 18. And there's no reason why I should have had a prostate exam time after time after time after time after time after time while I was at the University of Michigan. Let's get started. One, I just want to thank you guys for coming on. Ivana Clark, um, esteemed journalist, uh, who I feel like I know you from your writing. And then obviously we've got Amos Giora, uh, who is the author of Armies of Enablers, which will be out the fourth? Today. 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 I got the book. When I met with one of the Michigan State women, she was insistent that be our meat, not our meat of enabler. Because she says that everywhere she turned, here, 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 there was an enabler. So for her, it's our meat of enabler that um, enabled the predator. And, she, and once I started speaking with other survivors, they absolutely resonated with this theme of armies. And one of the women, and John, I've mentioned this to you before, I'm making an you and I spoke. One of the women who I spent time with said the worst thing that the enablers did was abandon the survivor. So you have abandonment by army, plural. I think, John, in terms of your desire to have a you know, deep dive conversation here, it's really important to focus that it's not a person it's this notion of institutionalized complicity, which really is, from my perspective, as I write in the book, that's the essence of our needs and the survivor's perspective. If we finally begin, emphasize, begin, the process of addressing the enabler, you will have done an extraordinary public service. That's the battle. I think the sheer the sheer scale of the, of a story like this is um, serves the institution because it's very difficult for um, 
even many intrepid journalists who are following this to, to kind of to break through um, because there's so much there's so much there's so much uh, holding holding pulling us back from that information. Clearly, this is a very toxic problem that's very widespread. I think we've, um, we know some of it, we're reckoning with some of it, that's good and important. We're, it's very much still in process. I don't think we're near the end game. Large institutions and the notion of protecting institutions, in the context of armies, this is about institu protecting institutions, people in the institution protecting the institution rather than protecting the vulnerable. There were four distinct times that this predator could have been stopped. 1978, 1988, 1993, and 2018. In 1978, uh, he was fired and then unfired as allegations of sexual harassment, sexual abuse were made by a male student to only be unfired and then ceremoniously uh, celebrated and then buried within the athletic department under the guise that we will take him out of circulation or seeing the paid, more affluent students and then um, he will work with the scholarship athlete that obviously came from a lower socioeconomic and ethnic background. In 1988, I stepped on campus at the University of Michigan as a student athlete. At that time, Don Kanan, the athletic director, had retired. Bo Schimbeckler was still the head coach, but he also took on the responsibilities of athletic director. That was probably the time when Bo had the most power and authority at the University of Michigan. But coinciding with that power and authority is when I was raped the first time by Dr. Anderson. You've heard some argue that Bo didn't have the power that Don Kanan had at the university, but at that point, Bo was athletic director and could have fired this doctor. That doctor was not fired. In 1993, uh, the University of Michigan actually purchased the private practice of Dr. Anderson. And up until 2018, there was a letter that was sent by a former wrestler, uh, last name DeLuca, to Ward Manuel, the athletic director, about his experience and sexual abuse at the hands of Dr. Anderson. The university didn't even admit to any possible wrongdoings until an article came out in February of 2020 in the Detroit News that told the world about what had been going on in Michigan for the last 40 to 50 years. Under the real revelation that, um, revelation and realization actually that I was a victim and seeing how the university since February not only has or did hire <laughs> the attorney that represented Jeffrey Epstein and Roman Polanski, but to also, outside of a federal lawsuit, contacted over 300,000 former students outside of the time that they tried to contact close to 7,000 former athletes about their experiences at the University of Michigan during the tenure of Dr. Anderson and how the narrative has been controlled and pretty much directed by the University of Michigan, not from the voice of a victim like myself. I decided to tell my truth. They can throw out all those great backs and great quarterbacks and great defensive players throughout the country and in this conference. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. 
No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. In March of this year, I learned about Michigan's long-standing culture of repeated abuse, molestation, rape, and cover-up. These revelations have kept me up at night for the last six months. This has been a very difficult time for me. Feelings of anger and betrayal have cycled through my mind as I think about the decades-long culture of repeated and documented abuse, manipulation, duplicity, and cover-up at Michigan and my fellow Big Ten institutions. My love and sacrifice for Michigan should not be questioned. Though it crushes me, I will not be silent or complicit with the wrongdoing. We must concentrate on the truth. Whether you are a victim, the Michigan administration, the Big Ten Conference, or the NCAA, this perverse culture of abuse must stop. I am not John Doe. I am John Vaughn, a Michigan man. The team. If a football program is to be evaluated, the first thing you evaluate is um, what effect has it had on the youngsters that have played? 